Welcome to the third day of this extraordinary important summit. Uh, my name is Linda Grattan. I'm Professor of Management Practice at the London Business School, and I'm also co-chair of the Council on Jobs. Let me just spend a moment just putting some in this into context, which for what will be a session that's primarily focused on priorities. What should be the priorities that we take now in terms of accelerating our action around reskilling and upskilling and indeed on training? Um, as you will see from the Future of Work uh, Jobs report, which the WEF will be uh, publishing shortly, uh, there's been a massive change, dramatic shifts in jobs and in the skills landscape. Uh, and that means for many people, more than 50% of people around the world, upskilling and reskilling is going to be crucial to their long-term livelihood. Yet despite this economic downturn, employers still realize how important training is to their workforce. In fact, as we'll see in the new report, uh, more than 66% of them are saying that they value uh, reskilling and upskilling their employees. The challenge is that only 17% actually say, I can see the return on investment now. And that's going to be a problem. Now, what are we also seeing? Well, a huge rise in online learning platforms. And I speak myself as a business school professor when I say this will certainly transform the way that we educate and on our panel today are a whole a, a number of people who are playing a key role in developing those online platforms but it isn't just about workers of course it's also about the children who are being prepared to live in this extraordinary world and here that, that, that we, we know that more than 1.6 billion young people have been impacted by countrywide closures. So clearly, this is an enormous issue. It's day three of this reset. And the, and the focus is on what might we do? What would be the priorities that we want, number one, to be taking right now? Now, to help us answer that question over the next half an hour, we have an extraordinary uh, panel. Let me introduce each one of them to you. May I first of, of, of all introduce Salil Pakresh, who is the CEO of Infosys, obviously crucial in terms of uh, the people they employ, but also the technology that they're bringing to the world. Next, could I introduce Prime Minister Shate of uh, Palestine National Authority, who is taking a government responsibility. What should governments be doing right now? May I introduce Alain Dehez, who's the CEO of ADECO, one of the world's largest uh, developers of people and indeed of, of one of the major recruiters in, in the world right now. May I introduce Mariam Jami, who's the founder and CEO of I Am The Code from the United Kingdom and one of our young global leaders. Uh, can I introduce Ashish Advani, who's president and chief operating officer of JA Worldwide, who was absolutely clear about the scale of the challenge in terms of upskilling, particularly around digital and entrepreneurial jobs. And finally, may I introduce Hi, Hi Hadi Patova, who's the founder and CEO of CodeOrganization.com. Uh, um, may I, uh, let, let me just go straight into into the questions. By the way, both uh, Salil um, and Alain are both, like me, co-chairs of the council. So uh, we're going to be very much part of this and very much look forward to these conversations that are going to take place over the coming months. Let me start, Prime Minister, by asking you from a government perspective, um, how do you think a reset in education and learning will support the long-term economic recovery. Over to you. Thank you so much for having me and I'm happy to share uh, this uh, session with very distinguished uh, colleagues. Uh, within the limited time that we have, it's important to mention one important issue, which is knowledge that has been generated in the last, uh, in the last century is much more than knowledge that has been generated since uh, Adam until 1950. So there has been incredible acceleration of generating knowledge. One second important issue, there is a serious transformation of the tools 
of learning, of uh, tools of education. And third, uh, we have seen serious transformation of um, uh, not only labor market, but labor market in relation to technology. Look, there are cars without drivers. There are planes without pilots. There are clinics without doctors. But in order for uh, a drone over Pakistan or Afghanistan, you need, there is no pilot in the drone, but you need 16 new experts to analyze the data that is transmitted from the drone. So therefore, what I mean to say is there are quite a number of jobs that are dying, quite a number of jobs that are born or emerging. One, the other important issue in our case, for example, <clears throat> because of the corona and because of other realities, one has to focus on the outcome of the education process because the product of the education process is itself an input into the labor market. In the case of Palestine, unemployment was high. Most of my predecessor tried to address the issue of the demand side of the labor market. What we did is that we started to focus on the supply side of the labor market. And therefore, we created, we canceled 120 different measures in all Palestinian universities. And we introduced 60 new measures to adapt to the new emerging reality of technology, of green economy, on Savaita, and so on. More than that, we are ourselves establishing specialized university on technical and vocational training university. We call it not college university because of the prestige. Students, they want to feel that they are going to a university, not to a college, not to a center, not to uh, something else. More than that, uh, dear colleagues, we have realized one important thing. I think it's worth it to learn from the experience of Palestine, which is the rehabilitation of university graduates. <clears throat> Most of the unemployed university graduates, they, fo they are focused on certain majors, Arabic language, English literature, and so on and so forth. Now what we are doing is rehabilitating these university graduates. We are teaching them how to become computer coders. We introduce coding so that Palestine will have the label of coding. We introduce other vocational training uh, issues that Students themselves, instead of relying on a job with the private sector or relying on a job with the government, I want them to be self-employed. And that is where the, the twin relationship or the dual system of academia and vocational training, which is the German model and to a certain extent the Swiss model and others, uh, that is crucial in the a new emerging reality of the labor market. So therefore, we are focusing on this rehabilitation of the newly graduates who don't have a chance to get a job and they themselves become self-employed. We have also, a st we started a, a special academy for gifted students where you need to take students from say, framed streams into a multidisciplinary education system because this sort of, you know, framed streams don't take people anywhere. Now, I know in the British universities, multidisciplinary approach is used, whether it is at this university of that, you see students studying psychology, economics, and history, political science, and so on. So the basic education should be really multidisciplinary, not only with the tools, but also look at what it is happening with Corona. We have 1.2 million students in Palestine, 50% of them stay home. The other 50 go to school so that we, we don't concentrate them all in one day. But that needs a lot of technology. We have improved internet in remote areas. Uh, students have uh, laptops, students have tablets, and we are working hard to really satisfy these needs. So what I'm saying is that, and this is my conclusion, we need to look at the tools, one second. We need to look at the product of the education process because the product of the education process is itself the input of the labor market. And third, we need to rehabilitate the new graduates, look at the measures, cancel what is not needed, introduce a new measures, impose on universities what they should be doing. Don't leave it to universities. Education should not be commercially driven. Education should be a totally different story. That is where we are. I don't want to take much of your time, but the most important thing is that 
tools of knowledge are not anymore the same. Well, thank you so much, Prime Minister. And actually, in many ways, we're very fortunate because we have a couple of people on the panel who have really worked to disrupt education and really to focus on building entrepreneurship and digital skills. Ashish, that's really been what you've been doing at JA Worldwide. And I wondered, you know, as you look at COVID-19 and the uh, pandemic and the impact that it's had on young people, I mean, how do you think that young people can now really navigate these new jobs? What would be your priorities for action? Sure, I, 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 I do agree with, with, with everything the Prime Minister said. I'm so glad to hear that we have a national leader who really recognizes that entrepreneurship education is a priority. And it's something which could be taught using the digital tools that we have now. So it can be taught in a high-tech way. It can be taught in a low-tech way and in a no-tech way. And we really found at JA, we operate in over 115 countries. And our national leaders are adapting our programs very rapidly based on the reality of COVID. And I will say that if I could just focus on the priority skills that young people need. So even if, if, if after doing an entrepreneurship program, they don't become entrepreneurs, the soft skills that they learn from communication skills to adaptiv adaptability skills become so important in the job market, knowing that young people are gonna have potentially seven careers and over 20 jobs. During COVID, I think the importance and the recognition that the unemployment is potentially gonna to continue to go up given the economic strains in society, training these young people to have the mindset of being job creators is more important now than ever. You know, you know, I went through the program when I was young and I can tell you that if you reach people at a young age where you can actually get them to think of themselves as people who actually are economic agents of change, who have the confidence and the capability to be an entrepreneur, it lasts for a long, long time. Put differently, if you don't reach them at a young age, for them to feel that way at, you know, at a later age is much harder. And it's so cost effective to actually deliver a program to reach young people in school. It's such a small investment. Uh, we make our programs free to schools, so it really isn't difficult to reach you know, vulnerable populations and create that mindset shift at an early age. We've rolled out a micro-credential to show to employers that young people actually have these skills. Uh, because the, the high stakes testing world that we live in where everyone's preparing for, for a, a college admissions with high test scores really hasn't created the incentive system for schools to adopt entrepreneurship education. The micro credential is called the Entrepreneurial Skills Pass. And I'm happy to say that it's continuing during this crisis to grow because, because national governments recognize that we need to have some incentives to teach entrepreneurship. The Entrepreneurial Skills Pass is, is now in over uh, 38 countries and continues to grow. So we're partnering with both employers to recognize the micro-credential, partnering with the young people to put it on their LinkedIn profile, and partnering, of course, with governments to get access to schools. A JA, for over 100 years now, has been building these relationships with school systems. And I, I can't tell you, in the UK, it's called Young Enterprise. It, in the Middle East, it's called Injaz. But the JA Worldwide Network is working so hard to... to leverage these relationships with teachers and school systems to continue to make entrepreneurship education a priority during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, I think we're, all, you know, I think we're already beginning to see where these priorities are coming from. Uh, Prime Minister has told us that it's really about the tools. It's about making sure we have people who are job ready. We've heard from uh, a, an impassioned view of uh, entrepreneurship should be at the very top of the agenda, but also a, a clear understanding that credentials are going to be crucial. And certainly in the council that we've been running for the last year, this question of credentials, how do you credentialize young people so they can get a job is going to be crucial. Let's take a look at the technological aspects now, because certainly one of the things we've heard from the very beginning of COVID is that people have been amazed by how much uh, technology has played a role to really upskill. People have moved onto platforms uh, faster than we'd ever imagined. Sally, you must have been seeing that at the, at the center as you've been managing Infosys. What, what do you think is going to happen with regard to technology and learning? Thanks, uh, Linda, and thank you for having me on this panel. Um, the, the, the technology, as you rightly point out, has been an incredible change agent. There are three real elements that I think uh, worth looking at. One is on content and really the way content is being created, packaged, 
uh, re, re put together in smaller bites is very critical in this new digital distribution framework. The second is on access. Access has been hugely expanded. Today, access is available much more broadly than it was in the past with this new technology platforms. And the third is distribution. And what I mean is beyond things like laptops and desktops and tablets, it's on smartphones. Uh, and we can see that depending on the shape of the various economies that this is available. So with these three elements that need much more focus, they, they need tremendous transformation, which is being enabled by the digital platform. We're seeing a massive skilling and also a reskilling agenda. The yeah. skilling is for the first time a person to, to sort of build out these skills and the reskilling is within large organizations, within large sections of society where the reskilling helps to bring new jobs or new ways of looking at things. Yeah. So we, we believe the technology has been a huge, huge transformation agent. This is going to continue well after the medical crisis is behind us because we've now learned a new way of working and that access is not going to go back. So with content access distribution, there's more skilling and more reskilling. Uh, thanks, Linda. Thank you so much. So, so for you, the priorities are absolutely about really making sure, as the Prime Minister said at the, at the very beginning, there is so much knowledge in the world, but how do we exactly. make that modular so that people have easy access to it? And how do we use platforms to make it more uh, uh, accessible? Now, you know, the other issue that we've been talking about over the last year is this issue of how do you connect individuals with their skills to jobs. And Alain, you're absolutely at the heart of that because you see how labor markets develop. You see how job skills are related then to, to how skills are related to jobs. And that's really what I wanted to ask you about. I mean, what do you think uh, in the current context has to change to really accelerate uh, upskilling and reskilling? In just two minutes, uh, Linda, thank you for the invitation. Six words. Ah. Uh, Six words, finally start a multi-stakeholder inclusive action plan. Yeah. Finally, because there have been a lot of talks since few years, but very, very limited action. So now we should start. Multi-stakeholders, because it is not reskilling, upskilling, or training is not a question, an individual question, or a business question, or a government question. No, it is really something which has to be let's say, elaborated as a kind of ecosystem in which each part should be committed. Individuals should be committed to stay employable and therefore to upskill or reskill himself or herself. Business should stay competitive and attractive and so invest in upskilling and reskilling. And government should also make sure that the country is staying competitive and attractive and thus invest in upskilling and reskilling. Just a few ideas, because it's not only uh, claiming that, but uh, what and how. I think government, I see a lot of grant subsidies and so on, nothing about upskilling, reskilling, and training. No single one. So I think rather today, we should invest in the future. And it's good that government is supporting companies, uh, industries, and so on, but they should support them for the future. So, and, and having tax credits, fiscal measures uh, regarding upskilling and, and upskilling and reskilling. We speak about the individual, individual learning account. That's the moment to put in place that kind of, of instrument. And, and also consider uh, investment uh, in upskilling and reskilling as a real investment and, and allowing as such a, a differentiated accounting treatment. The same for the business. They should invest in employability, not per se in jobs. This is very important so, so that they can play out into non-mobility. And, and again, for the individuals, not only the art skills, but also the soft skills. And, and for me, going forward, emotional intelligence will be extremely important. And to finish, inclusive, because one of the big threats of this COVID situation is to let a lot of displaced people along the road and not part of the journey. And we should make sure that we are also fighting inequality 
and that all this action plan is really inclusive for all kinds of population in this world. Thanks. So, I mean, one of the things that I loved about this panel when I saw who was here is that we are a multi-stakeholder group. You know, we have a prime minister, we have CEOs of one of the CEO of one of the largest companies, techn technology companies in the world. We have social enterprise. Uh, I mean, this is a multi-stakeholder group. And my feeling is that we need to do so much more, and I agree with you, Alain, uh, to understand how these systems work, but also teach people how to manage in a multi-stakeholder group. Because whilst we're talking today about COVID-19, the next big challenge the world faces is climate change. And that can only be solved if we all learn how to work together. We talked earlier about children and how actually when you think about how people are prepared for the world of work, uh, there's a real anxiety, I think, about what's happened to kids uh, during, during COVID. Um, and and Mariam, I wanted you to, to, to think a little bit more about that. That. And really to say, you know, what do you think? What do you think is the priority in terms of making sure that we have our systems accessible to the children of the world? Over to you. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. I mean, I totally agree with everything Alain just said. I am the uh, testimony of a system failing children and, and, and boys and girls across the world. So I didn't go to school. I didn't have the opportunity many people have today to have PhDs and masters and, and all of that. And so I think what is really important right now is for us to start thinking ahead. Uh, inclusion matters, but we really need to think about inclusion in a way that we actually mean that. Not diversity, but we need to include young boys and girls growing up across the world. And the starting point to that is actually to make sure the human rights is respected. We give the girls and the boys the tools our private school girls have our other girls across the world and boys have. And I don't understand why, as human beings, we can't think about this. Any technologist, whoever is inventing and creating a tool, they need to include everyone. Now, I know education is expensive and we can't include everyone, but I think there's a massive starting point right now, and COVID has taught us this, and, uh, to make sure that we include boys and girls. At the same time, we give them the tools they need so they can be part of the future global workforce. By 2030, at I am the code, we're going to teach 1 million women and girls to learn how to code. The girls we're teaching how to code, they're not part of the mainstream girls. They're marginalized girls. They're girls from favelas, from slums. The girls no one actually talked to about. But I know I am right now accelerating humanity, and I'm building the biggest pipeline of the world where uh, tomorrow uh, companies will tell me, Mariam, I need 100 Java coders. I need 100 uh, PhD coders. I need people to come and help me do my AI work or climate change issues. Who's going to do that? So if you're going to just focus on the few people and forget the other, the, the other we're not going to, this is not humanity and this is not inclusion. And so I think my, my last point is, as a, we have all the tools we need. We have connectivity, mm -hmm. connections, infrastructure. I mean, you just have to name it. Everyone is inventing. But distribution, who's distributing what and who, who's having access. So I think my call for this call, and I'm so honored to be part of it and to be included because I think what Sadia did and her team is to include my voice. Because like I said earlier, you know, if you ask him in 1970s, 1980s, would you be sitting at the World Economic Forum talking about education? I wouldn't believe that. But someone included me. That's why I'm here talking to you today. So my girls need to be part of the, uh, the conclusion, need to be part of the conversation in 2030. So then we can all say we actually did as a, as a community and as a team. Mariam, thank you so much. I mean, I think on behalf of all of us on the panel and all of those listening in, and I can see some of the chats already, we really appreciate that. And we really appreciate that for you, inclusion has got to be the number one priority. It's interesting, isn't it? Your view that we have all the tools. Let's uh, move on now to, I, I wanted to talk to Hadie about the delivery of education, because that's been a, a big conversation recently. Um, and how do we be sure that when we build back, we build back better, particularly that we build back better with regard to education. Hadi, what would your priorities be for this? Thank you very much. Uh, and I also want to really amplify what Mariam said about the importance of inclusion when you think about education. So the work we do at Code.org is really focused on thinking about not only how we teach our students, but what are we teaching students when you think of primary and secondary education. Uh, you know, at a time of the, the changing nature of the, of the world of work, of course, reskilling today's adults is critically important, but it's important to uh, remember that roughly one and a half billion people are currently in an education system 
that is preparing them for the jobs of yesterday by teaching the curriculum of 100 years ago. All around the world, every country is funding a public education system, teaching courses that were designed last century or even two centuries ago. And those courses didn't imagine the future that we're about to enter. Uh, and when we think about that, people all the time think about how can we improve school? And what they think about is how do we use technology in the classroom, but to still teach the same stuff that they learned when they were young. Whereas today's kids, the thing they want to learn more than anything else, as, as you know, Prime Minister, uh, as the Prime Minister said, is things like coding and computer science. So many people here in this group have done things or, or as, as a, you know, the J worldwide uh, emphasis on entrepreneurship. Computer science and entrepreneurship are not only the skills that students need the most, it's the ones they want the most. And meanwhile, if you go into a school in almost any part of the world and you look on the faces of students, their eyes are glazed over because they're memorizing something from a history book from, you know, from hundreds of years ago, or they're learning to solve math that is important, but not as engaging as what it would be to create an app, to create a small business, to create a website. That, you know, for students, technology is their world. You give it to them and it's, you know, they immediately feel at home with it in a way that adults don't. But in schools, they're told, no, 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 no. Let's learn this stuff from 200 years ago. So I think as part of reopening schools for COVID-19, after the COVID-19 pandemic passes us over, every public education system in the world needs to think more deliberately, how do we make computer science part of the primary and secondary curriculum? Uh, we've been fortunate in the United States, Code.org, sorry, I was going to say Code.org has now helped us get to 47% of schools in the country now teaching computer science as part of the curriculum. So we're almost halfway there. Uh, but the rest of the world needs to do this as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Hadi. I mean, in the three minutes that we have left, or one minute, let me say the five priorities that have come out of our panel. Uh, this is for the World Economic Forum, for everybody who's listening. Number one, this has to be multi-stakeholder. Part of the reason this panel is so extraordinary is it represents people from every part of the ecosystem. Number two, it's got to be inclusive. Otherwise, in 10 years time, we won't have the right people sitting in the right jobs. Number three, we've really got to leverage technology. It's been one of the most extraordinary aspects of COVID. So many people use technology. Number four, it's got to be about credentials. We've got to build more credentials that allow our young people to get the sort of jobs they need. And number five, we've got to think about the new uh, skills, particularly entrepreneurship and digital skills, which are going to help our young people thrive. Thank you so much for joining this session. Thank you so much to our panel. And do keep involved with the World Economic Forum and its reset agenda. Each one of us on the panel is involved in that. We'd love to to see you again. And thank you also for your many questions. Thank you very much.